Okay, happy to welcome everyone to the second colloquium, first in person, we've tried in quite a while. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and step aside and let uh, Marty Israel introduce our speaker. Okay, it's a real pleasure to introduce Brian Rao, a longtime colleague of mine and colleague of, of my close colleague, Bob Bin, uh, who's also with us on Zoom today. Uh, Brian received his PhD from Washington University in 2008. Uh, usually we just talk about PhDs and beyond, but for Brian, I must start the introduction really with his bachelor's degree, a joint major of physics and math is from Washington University in 1996. Uh, he uh, and in between his bachelor's from here and his PhD back here, he picked up a master of science in nuclear engineering at the University of Maryland in College Park. Uh, after he got his PhD, he spent three years with hypertech systems in, in the Los Angeles area. And he then returned here as a postdoc and spent three years as a postdoc from 2011 to 14, and then a year as research scientist. And he has been a research assistant professor here uh, for since 2016. Uh, he's going to be talking today about cosmic rays from Super Tiger and Kalet. Now, Brian and the Tiger, the whole Tiger program. Brian goes back to it till his undergraduate days when he was with us, including on a balloon flight, and he was very involved from the beginning. Uh, super, this same program was the meet for his PhD when he returned, and uh, he has been a, had a key role in the Super Tiger development out of Tiger uh, since then. Uh, in Calet, the other major experiment he'll be talking about. He's had a key role uh, from the beginning of Wash U's involvement. And Bob had been the PI of both of these, but uh, including the Wash U PI of, of Tiger, of Kalet, and the full PI of, Ti of the Super Tiger. But a couple of years before his retirement, a few years ago, uh, the PI ships of both of these things and another experiment that's not on the docket today uh, has been in Brian's very capable hands. So uh, it's really a pleasure to hear from Brian about what's been going on with Super Tiger and Kellett. Brian, welcome or re-welcome. All right, well, thank you. I haven't been introduced since I defended and I haven't lectured here since I uh, did a grad student seminar a long time ago. All right, so as has already been said, cosmic ray astrophysics on balloons and the ISS, the Super Tiger and Kellett. So you have pictures from each. Hopefully this, I need to click on it. Let me just click on it again. Okay, good. Oops, I didn't have myself. At least I don't have any videos this time. So, you know, my question is, oh, can I hide this? Does anybody make this not show up? Uh, everything's fine now. Huh. I'm just seeing what I think you want us to see. Oh, okay, that's fine. Sorry, it's it shows up on the screen here. Well, it's also showing up on on that screen. But anyway, yeah. So anyway, anyway, moving on. Um, this is probably about as out of the way as it, it's going to get. Yeah. All right. So um, all of the cosmic rays, someone wanted to know what, what all of them were. And just having recently done the International Cosmic Ray Conference in Berlin remotely, which was no fun. I don't recommend international conferences remotely, personally. And what I recall, of course, the cosmic rays are energetic particles from outer space. They come from outside the solar system and also the sun in some cases. And they include atomic nuclei, um, electrons, include antimatter, mostly positrons and antiprotons, although people search for other things. They include gamma rays and they include neutrinos. And when I was gonna do this PowerPoint, I'd have these arrows popping up in sequence, but they're all up at once. 
Kellett on the space station covers just about everything to some degree, except neutrinos. Super Tiger is entirely focused on atomic nuclei and the heavier ones of, the, of those. And I did also mention Anita Poyle briefly because that's another experiment we work on here. I've worked on and took over from Bob. And uh, it is designed to measure the highest energy neutrinos, but it also measures the highest energy, ultra high energy cosmic rays with atomic nuclei. Because I touched that. All right, great. Again, this is all going to be so fancy. Um, now that we're PDF. So what's the you know, what's the place of the big picture for this, right? So the universe is mostly dark energy, over seventy percent dark energy, almost a quarter dark matter, and then just a small, less than five percent of atoms. So of course, not being the kind of person to go after a Nobel Prize, I'm going to focus on the more mundane atoms. And of those, about four percent of that is a uh, you know hydrogen helium. So it's mostly just free hydrogen helium. Only half percent stars. And a tiny 0.03% is heavy elements. And by that, you just mean metals. If you're talking like an astronomer, it's heavier than helium. So that's that fraction. And then we switch from the big picture view of the universe over to the galactic view. And we have two samples of interstellar, me interstellar me medium to uh, consider in the galaxy. One is uh, the solar system. It's about a 5 billion year old sample, 4.6 billion year old sample of the galactic material. and uh, it has you know, most of its gas, about a percent of its dust by mass, and 91% hydrogen, almost 9% helium, and just a tiny 0.1% everything heavy. Then there's the galactic cosmic rays. This is a much fresher source of the galactic material. It's a few million years old, and it's a sample of some ISM, we think, but we're not exactly sure what else is mixed in. And it's much thinner, right? So uh, you know, the ISM in general is an atom per cubic centimeter, but the cosmic rays are 10 to the minus nine per cubic centimeter. So it's a thin rain as, as someone in this group once, once upon time called it. Um, the fractionation, it's 99% nuclei and 1% electrons. And that's significant because Kellett, the Kellett Triple Electron Telescope is designed to measure electrons specifically, the highest energy electrons, but it also measures nuclei. And then the nuclei are 90% hydrogen, 9% helium and 1% heavier things. And it's the heavier things that we're most interested in here at WashU. So a little bit about cosmic rays. Um, they're relativistic charged particles, at least the ones we're, I'm gonna be talking about in this talk, nuclei and electrons. So we're gonna neglect all the other ones we already mentioned, except in passing through Kellett. Um, cosmic rays are isotropic, which is to say that they come same flux and from all directions. They don't point back to the source and that's because Charged particles are deflected by magnetic fields. And even though the galactic magnetic fields are weak, they're very large scale. And by the time cosmic rays get any real distance from their source, they've been randomized in direction. Um, they're very high energy. Of course, they're naturally speaking since we're talking about relativistic. They're accelerated by supernova shocks and probably other, sh other sources besides. And uh, we, when we look at the cosmic rays, we look at the abundances of elements we see all stable and many radioactive elements. And those who have instruments sensitive to isotopes, ACE Chris on the Chris instrument on the ACE satellite um, have observed both character, both stable and radioactive elements there as well. So when I we talk about cosmic rays, it's natural to compare them to the solar system. And when we do that, we use solar system abundance from Katerina Lauders. And this plot is using 2003, but she's constantly producing improved and updated abundances and these haven't necessarily get around to uh, using them. The galactic cosmic rays plotted are for 2 GeV per nucleon. And so I'm comparing from hydrogen up to zirconium, which is charge 40. And you see that there's a lot of similarity between these trends. And uh, also I should point out that we normalize the so silicon equals one. And so there's a lot of similarity, but there are some, some real differences. And solar system, uh, you know, is there are a lot of places where there are major valleys where the solar system is compared to to the cosmic rays. And in some instances, a lot of instances, that's because the uh, cosmic rays interact on their way here. They travel through you know, a few grams per cubic, few grams per centimeter squared of density of material on the way here. Um, but that's enough to in induce a lot of uh, fragmentation. And so the lithium beryllium boron at the bottom periodic cable there are particularly sensitive. And this is actually a major source of those elements is how they're synthesized from cosmic ray fragmentation. But otherwise, they're broadly similar. 
And it's where we look at the differences we can see and above, the, uh, above the iron peak, which is the end of fusion that helps point to uh, source information. Okay, so Kazagori's and energy. The plot here on the left is the, uh, the all particle energy spectrum. So it's everything, but that's dominated obviously by protons since that's 90% helium, uh, that's another 9%. You see, you span many orders of magnitude in energy and and uh, in flux, and I, I plotted where Super Tiger and Kellett fall on the energy scales, and you can see Super Tiger is much lower, it's a much smaller range and lower total reach than Kellett. Kellett is specifically designed, having been designed to measure and make direct measurement of the highest energy electrons, as a deep calorimeter that enables it to, to make those measurements. You see there's a feature called the knee above which people believe that the sources are extra galactic and not as well understood. We don't know exactly what it is, although there are theories involving active galactic nuclei. And the high end of the scale, various in the scale, like the highest energy particles will have the momentum of a major league fastball when they smack into the Earth's atmosphere, which are, but they're obviously very, very rare. And the problem, you can see that the particles per, um, you know, uh, meter second and meter squared year and kilometer squared year pointed out there. So in order to observe these rare high energy particles, you need either and or both a large detector or a whole lot of time and usually both. And when you're looking at the highest energy ones to observe them, people will look at the atmosphere, large sections of the atmosphere, look up at the sky or in the instance of um, balloon born Pueyo, they'll look down or look across from a, a stratospheric point of view. So um, Super Tiger's energy range, uh, 300 MeV per nucleon to uh, 10 GeV per nucleon, Kellett's uh, one to 10 to six GeV total energy. So when you speak of per nucleon, you're saying per, you're getting yeah, um, it's a kinetic energy versus the total energy, but the calorimeter has a total energy. So that's why we speak of it in that, that different in terms there. Highest energy, as I already said, they're extra galactic, and we rather than you talk about the power law. All right, so cosmic ray is an atomic number. So since we're focusing on nuclei, again, hydrogen and helium are dominant. But you see also that this, the relative abundances of these elements fall off very steeply, especially below hydrogen and helium, but then again at iron. And the ultra heavy cosmic rays above iron, particularly zinc and up, um, that's what we are focused on measuring with Super Tiger, but we also can make a significant measurement with Kellett through zirconium. And on the left, on the right margin, you can see the particle rate for a, just a meter squared detector as a function of uh, as as a function of atomic number or element. And you can see that they get very quickly get very rare as you get into the UH range. And so again, there's a real premium for both size or and or um, duration of collection. And I note also HEO3 HME, the heavy nuclear explorer. This was an instrument of Bob and Marty. Bob Benz and Marty Israel were uh, leaders on. And it made the best measurements to date for elements toward the end of the periodic table. Um, it's since been supplanted at least in part of its range by recent super tiger measurements that I'm going to be showing you. So the relative abundances, you know, what's made where, right? Hydrogen and helium come out of the Big Bang. And then up to uh, iron, it's more, it's a fusion for the most part with some cosmic ray spoliation production. And then beyond iron though, it's a rapid or slow process neutron capture. And um, oh, I did mention spoliation, it's nice. So that process happens slowly, right? By definition, it happens over the lives of stars while they're doing, while they're burning, you know, Fusion's ongoing and heavier nuclei will pick up neutrons that get produced just in decays and other reactions within the stars and very slowly build up the nucleus with plenty of time to decay back to stability along the way. Whereas with rapid, it happens very quickly, so fast that it, neutrons keep adding before there's a chance to decay stability. So you get neutron heavy, you get different isotope production that way. And different and some elements are predominantly R or some are predominantly S. And so while we believe we understand that the S process is happening predominantly in massive stars during their lives, their process 
is understood used to be thought that it was all happening during supernovae, but now we understand the compact binary mergers, including the binary neutron star mergers, are very likely sources of significant contributions of our process. And so it's the right mixture and where, where, which elements come from which process. And of course, there's just unknowns. We don't know what all is doing that. All right, so I need to move on to Kellett. So it's the first thing we're talking about in this Kellett collaboration. And this is as of a certain date because I didn't have time to update it. And I didn't want to be misrepresent the current status. It's a collaboration involving, led by the Japanese and involving Italians and Americans. And we're, Bob and Marty and I are in there somewhere. And now Wolfgang. So Kellett is a photometric electron telescope, as has been said. It's on the International Space Station. And it is focused on, of course, making electron observations. And this colorimeter is, is, is uh, specifically designed for electron, electromagnetic measurements, but it also will measure nuclei. And again, the energy ranges up to one PeV for the nuclei and 20 TeV for the electron. It also measures um, gamma rays and looks for coincidence with uh, gamma ray bursts and also gravitational wave sources, solar flares and whatnot. And you can see the palette uh, at the bottom left, just the basic structure of the cal main calorimeter is at the front that they are pointing at it conveniently. So just a little bit, just a little bit more about the detector. I'm not going to go into too much, but it has three main components. It has a charge detector of CHD at the top. It measures you know, scintillators to measure the charge of the incoming nucleus or electron. And then below that, there's an imaging calorimeter, which has multiple layers of scintillating fibers each of which is read out individually. So you can see where the particle track went through. And then below that is the total absorption calorimeter, which is the main energy measurement. And that captures as much of the energy as possible. There's always leakage with the, with the calorimeter instrument, but it's got good containment for electrons. Now, all these detectors work by um, measuring the light that's generated when ionization energy losses are converted within these special types of materials. And the exact um, characterization of, of how that depends, how this, how this light production depends upon the charge and energy of, of, of a species is very complicated. And we, uh, we, we handled this using models, um, using simulations, FX, Jant, and Fluca. So we used multiple ones to cross-validate that we have uh, tested and validated at CERN SBS runs. This is kind of what that kind of thing looks like. You go to, Go to CERN, the super proton synchrotron in the north area, and Prevacin, and you set up your detector and you expose it to beams. And we did, well, I'm going to show six at least beam test. I don't know if that's exactly the total count or not, but it's an adventure and an important part. It's a lot of what we do before we launch. And then eventually you get to launch. So Calit launched on August 19, 2015, and has been operating since shortly thereafter. It took about a month or so to get everything checked out. And the ISS orbits uh, 220 kil miles, about 350 kilometers, but of course varies and they have to keep correcting it every so often, reboosting it, and also reorienting it if the Russians fire the rockets and the things start spinning. And the inclination of the orbit is 51.6 degrees. So Kellett, well, you know, I mentioned energy spectra. I showed you the little particle spectra. Well, but with the more abundant elements, and you can see a plot in the bottom left showing um, Charge measurement for the CHD charge detector has two layers. And so they're plotting, cross plotting X and Y, and see it goes along the diagonal as you might expect in the three dimensional histogram here. And you see what you kind of expect in terms of the relative abundances, you know, hydrogen and helium being much more abundant, and then things falling off again after iron. But for the more abundant elements up through iron, you can measure spectra. And so they have shown here on the right plot. And they've been multiplied by arbitrary numbers just to separate them out, but you can see that. Kellett's made good measurements in comparison with other instruments. This is still a work in progress, of course. Um, at the ICRC, these, these are some of the other results that were presented. So we have a boron to carbon, and that's really important for understanding propagation. As I mentioned, the lightest elements are, are in particularly are produced in fragmentation products. So they're almost entirely or are entirely secondaries. So boron to carbon ratio helps with that. Also shown is the carbon spectra and the oxygen spectra that go into the carbon to oxygen ratio, which is a measurement shown. So again, the primary purpose of Cal is the electron spectrum, and you see they're very careful to put preliminary on everything. But you can see the Calit measurements are in red, and the electrons on the left, and the proton spectrum is on the right. 
And you can see the catalytic agrees with some instruments, other instruments measure, measurements, and it disagrees with others. And the fun part is it's not consistently agreeing with the same instruments on the same measurements, nor does it agree necessarily on the same with the same type of instrument or disagree. It varies with measurements. So it's just, uh, there's a lot to understand with this, and that's why it's good to have multiple instruments making the same measurements. And then some other, okay, helium and iron spectra. And so, you know, one of the interesting features is the high energies, the spectra picks up again, which is not expected. And that's seen in a lot of spectra, but it's not seen in iron. So that's one of the more recent uh, publications for Kella is showing the iron spectra is not showing this, this kick back up of the highest energies. So there's some clear difference. And a lot of, a lot of spectra seem to have that feature at the lower charge, lower atomic numbers. So it's telling you something. Uh, I mentioned that Kellett also does make gamma ray observations. And so I pulled this from the latest ICRC where you can see the galactic plane. You can see numbers of sources seen way back at the beginning. The very first meeting I went to, I did an estimate of the, the gamma rays that we would expect to see. And it was not very encouraging. I thought we'd only see the few most abundant, the brightest sources. But uh, fortunately, a grad student at LSU, now postdoc at Goddard, did a lot more work. and. Uh, you can see that they really can't observe significant significant sources and uh, the diffuse background. So the focus of WashU, though, as always, is on the ultra heavies, the rare elements beyond, well, really nickel, but you know, beyond, beyond iron. And this is work of Wolfgang Zober, which I really should have just explicitly put on there. I should have actually called everyone out. That was uh, oversight in my haste of throwing this together. The histogram on the left is what he showed at the ICRC, and you can see that. His analysis is really beginning to show some good resolution out in the ultra heavy range. And then comparing on the left, on the right rather, with um, other measurements for the even elements or the paired abundances. Well, I could speak up, but is it even or pairs? It's pairs on the Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Anyway, you can see that with this preliminary, and he's working to get individual elements, the odds and the even separate, both resolved and it looks looking promising anyway. You can see that we have reasonable agreement with the super tiger measurements we'll be talking about soon, but also with the ACE Chris measurements that have been made. And that's uh, Bob Benz and Marty Israel's current effort is focused on the ultra heavies there. Okay, moving on to super tiger because I probably can't speak too fast with the way things were. So this is the super tiger two collaboration or at least the most recent iteration of it. Um, we've lost our Minnesota colleague in the last couple of years, unfortunately. Um, Jake Waddington passed away, but we're going to continue to have him. And we've had a lot of uh, bonus graduate student participation and helping us that I'll point out later. It includes not just uh, Wolfgang and Nathan, who's now postdoc, but also Quinn Abar, Lindsay Posalda, and Andrew West. All right, so just a little bit about SuperTiger, which many people will have already seen. SuperTiger has two modules. And so I'm showing pictures of a mod full module on the left and an expanded view of a module on the right, where you can see all the direct detector components. You see it's a stack up of seven detector types, and there are three scintillators spread throughout, top and bottom, and, and underneath the, the trank offs, where there's an aerogel and acrylic. And also near the top and bottom, you have hotoscope planes. Hotoscope sunlighting up the fibers that give us trajectory and position and the instrument, which is vital for making corrections for instrument effects. That's in fact what graduate students spend most of their time doing is uh, instrument level corrections and to the analysis to get, the, get to the science. The science is the last minute and the end of the road, all of a sudden you're there kind of magical moment. Um, but the scintillators, they um, measure the light that is from ionization, but the, uh, the trank off detectors, that's the electromagnetic shock wave you get when you have a charged particle traveling through a dielectric medium at uh, greater than the local speed of light. And so the threshold is related to the index of refraction, inversely related. And so we have two, two different materials. You have uh, acrylic or plastic, which is about 1.5. So it turns on about two thirds the speed of light and then an aerogel, silica aerogel. So it's a kind of solid smoke, very thin material that is 1.04 or 1.025. And so that's very much closer to the speed of light before that turns on. 
And so that combination of detectors allows us to measure charge and, and velocity, which correlates obviously very directly with energy. And I'm not going to go into the full details of the analysis. I'm going to show results. But first and foremost, we'll go through the flights. Super Tiger 1, the first flight, was record setting at 55 days. You can see the full instrument um, model there on the upper left. You can see the two modules on the gondola. You get power, solar panels up front, and antennas. And this is just what, is, what it was like working in the, in the Caleb building in McMurdo. I wasn't there. I just got to monitor the flight for 55 days and do commanding from up here. So that, uh, you can see this, this pack of folks here in the upper center were the ones who deployed, including Bob. And you see at launch, you see the deflation. Those are vans in the foreground. You can see the tractor there as well. So large, it's a very large balloon. Once inflated, you can put a, put a, put a football field inside of it or have the Statue of Liberty stand inside of it. So it's, it's, a, it's a big big, 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 big balloon lifting a really heavy payload. You can see the size of the payload, up to 6,000 pounds. The bottom left, you can see the track. It went around the continent two and two thirds times. It's a shame it couldn't quite go any farther because we're getting close to the end of life of the termination battery and didn't want to risk letting it go any farther. And so the experiment flew, set a record 55 days. It has not been broken for a heavy lift zero pressure balloon and might never be broken. You never know, of course. You say that kind of thing and then someone will break it. And then it had to be recovered and it was recovered after two years because, well, the next season there was a government shutdown. And by the time it was recovered, you can see Thomas Hems, collaboration member now, NASA administrator, working to sing, almost single-handedly dig it out with the uh, help from the recovery groom team. That was successfully recovered. So now we move on to Super Tiger 2. And uh, we had quite a bit of adventure. We had in the first season. OK, I thought, thought it was good. First season, we had 16 launch attempts um, without any successful launches. So you know, hang test. We're all looking fresh. One launch attempt, two launch attempts, two launch attempts. Four launch attempts. This we got close. We actually were on the field. We we're about to lay out. And if we laid out, there would have been really hard to not launch because it's hard to put the balloon safely back in the box without tearing it. Fifth launch attempt was barely a launch attempt. And now we made it to Christmas. And you can see the group is shrinking. And seven launch attempt. Oh, eight. Here's Richard Bowes. Uh, you know, representing St. Louis as he's wanted to do. And that's how he, of course, gets to have Richard Bowes Day be June 5th. He gave the flag to the mayor and the mayor appreciated it. Oh, now it's New Year's. And you can see the group's got even smaller. We're down to four. It's a warmer day, 10th, 11, 12, 13. Well, we actually were rolling a bit. 14, well, it was a good, really good day. We're on the deck. Oh, and I was there for the penguin invasion. So there was a benefit. I was the person who went out there every day. A lot of people would hang back in McMurdo when we weren't having launch attempts, but because I happened to be there, I could see the penguins. Uh, the 15th launch attempt, we ran out of the, the wider tape. And so Kenichi here, Dr. Sakai, is, is uh, making the wider tape out of three rolls of narrower tape. <laughs> launch attempt 16, and then we gave up and packed it in. Well, the next season, we came down and we got a launch on December 20th, 2018. But the flight was less than seven hours. We couldn't clear 9,300 feet. We had a leaky balloon. It came down so fast that they didn't have a lot of choices. Once it goes below 60,000, there's an automatic termination system. And where it came in, it came in into a crevasse field. You can at least see the uh, fingers of the crevasses in this bottom picture, if you look hard enough. And it landed square in the middle of that crevasse field. So that was a real adventure to recover it. Um, it took three days of operations. First two days, we used uh, two helicopters to uh, first fly out there and get all the loose, removable, easily removable things off the gondola. And then the next day, we uh, had the helicopters disassemble the major components and carry them over to a uh, compression zone where an airplane can safely land, which was really quite epic. I'm, I'm glad it worked because it was my idea to lift the gondola off of the uh, instrument and I'm glad that it wrecked. 
Then on the third day, we went and assembled all and somehow got in the plane, the Basler there, in the allowed time on the ground. And that couldn't have been done without the help of uh, Andrew West and Lindsay Lasalda in the field. And yeah, I love this picture in the bottom, bottom right, because we're all smiling, but there's another picture that was taken just before when we were looking at, from the looking toward the tail, where we're not the only person smiling was Lindsay. She uh, she is a real trooper that way. The rest of us were looking as worn out as we feel. For those who come to the department, there's now a TV on the second floor by the elevator that cycles through lots of pictures from all the balloon programs, including Spider Now that we have Joanna Nagy here. And you'll see that you can see those people that I'm talking about. So we had to get it back to LDB. We had to reassemble it. We had to test it to show that it was in good enough shape to come back and fly the next year. We had to go through integration again. We had to refurbish it. We had to get help with uh, new grad student support. And uh, you can see both Wolfgang and Nathan in the bottom pictures. We got it ready, went to the, took it to Antarctica. At this time, we added the uh, APT light piggyback, which was integrated with the payload underneath it. We collected data um, that also was uh, cross-triggered with Super Tiger events and analyzed and uh, was, uh, has, has been, you know, it's been published and has gotten Jim Buckley, his own balloon instrument called the DAPT, Antarctic Demonstrator of, Demonstrator of APT, and, and, which is, I won't, I, won't, I won't say APT and get it wrong and while he's listening. Okay, so we actually got a launch again this time, and uh, this time we got a flight. We got a full 30 days and we around the continent twice, and we spent an awful lot of time to the north and over the water, which is very scary. Um, our altitude profile was reasonable, but it dipped a whole lot more when we're over the water. There's also albedo, and the albedo, the light shining off of the ice, heats the balloon and keeps it up higher. And most significantly, our one, of, one half of our instrument failed after just three days. And so even though we had 30 days of flight, which is significant fraction of 55 days, when you also take a hit on losing one of your modules, you get a lot less data. So our data for the Super Tiger 2 flight, which you can see the UH range is pretty sparse. And it's very sparse compared to what we'll see for Super Tiger the first flight. So with the status of the payload, and it's still here, um, it's not been recovered. Now we have COVID. Uh, related reasons why it's stuck on the ice. And I'm hoping that next season, not this upcoming season, but a year in 2022, I hope to be able to go down there and pick up our, our litter and recover it. We did get a high priority recovery, which was fun. We went through the Italian Mario, the Kelly base coming and going to get fuel. And we managed to pick up a lot of important pieces, including APT light, which was important for, for Jim to be able to do Jim and Zach, Zach Hughes, who got his PhD in part um, analyzing APT light data. And uh, also the bass piggyback experiment that collected air samples and ascent for Alex Metric on the fourth floor. And then two others that are from other, other institutions, EMIST and uh, PMC Turbo, Polar Mesosphere Clouds Turbulence is what that one stands for. And EMIST is exposing microbes in the stratosphere, which is meant to be it opens uh, trays that have um, bacteria on it and exposes them for different samples for different lengths of time because that's the stratosphere is apparently a good surrogate for the surface of Mars in terms of pressure and radiation environment. At least that's how they sold it flying on um, NASA balloons. This is just a little bit of fun because I got a seal, so there's some wildlife. And you can see that the group evolved quite a bit from the first season to the second season. And that's a nice little penguin shot there to the third season where it was almost entirely washy by the end. We had one person from Goddard <laughs> in the final year. And you can see Jim Buckley there. You can't make out that he's got an APT on his, his shirt, but he, he did think to represent. All right, so it's not all just, you know, uh, launch attempts and recovery and, and penguins and whatnot. There's actual real science to be had out of, out of Super Tiger. And, um, so Ryan Murphy got his PhD doing super tiger analysis through zirconium through charge 40. And what he found was his super tiger measurements agreed with the tiger measurements I got my PhD on, although with far, far better statistics, over eight times the statistics. But the real interesting advance here is Nathan Walsh has analyzed the evidences all the way to 
barium, which is charged with T6. And you can see here the red superposed fit on top of the histogram. An enormous amount of work has gone into giving here. And we're still working on the scientific impl impl implications of that. But one other thing to point out here is you can clearly see that we are out of statistics if we go any higher up. And we're also in the problem where it's very difficult to predict the charges where you don't have peaks. And with scintillators, there's saturation effects that make it hard. So it would be really problematic to try to make measurements to higher charges with separate balloon flights with this instrument. So, okay, what did we get out of Tiger? We got out of Tiger and then confirmed this with the Super Tiger results, a volatility-based supernova shock acceleration model from OB associations. And this, we had a lot of help from Katerina Lauders. Um, we suggested the nuclear um, composition of material from massive stars, a special composition fraction. About 20% of the material that comes from the winds and outflows of, and, and, the, and the supernova events themselves, mixed in with something like 80% regular ISM interstellar medium, does a good job of ordering our data. And our data then with that mixture model clump neatly into two lines, the top of which um, is refractory elements, those most likely to form dust grains, and condense onto dust grains. And then the other lower grouping is volatile stuff that's less likely to. And then you have trend lines that go as approximately as to the two thirds. And this is expected because the model has that um, the shock waves will accelerate the dust grains. The dust grains will have a small surface charge from photoionization, so they'll be very rigid particles, very little charge, very high mass. And they'll be accelerated superthermal energies, and then the atoms in the dust grain will get sputtered off by colliding with, with gas. And then they'll be preferentially injected into an acceleration mechanism that drives, the, drives them up to almost the speed of light. Well, I see we have this nice, this model works, we've got good, good agreement, reasonably good agreement. And then we get Nathan's results pushing it out to 56 and oh boy, um, we, we, we broke it. It doesn't work. Something is, is totally different here. All the data are clustering above the uh, refractory line. Um, not just the refractories, but the volatiles, they're all up there. And it's a good question of what exactly is going on. Now the odd elements are the ones that are above with the bigger, much larger um, uncertainties. And so if you just look at the, the even ones, which are relatively more abundant, they are, they're all much closer to listing. But you know, if we exclude the odds, we're still elevated above the refractory line in, in all cases, including volatile. So that suggests that our model's missing something. And it could be that there's some different um, mixture components that we should be mixing in, or it, I think is more likely that there's something about the accelerator that's different for these elements. But in order to address such things, we will move on to the future. We hope to propose this next, next year for the next NASA astrophysics pioneers called the Trans Iron Galactic Element Recorder for the International Space Station, or TIGRIS, including many of the same groups that uh, have been part of TIGRIS, but also adding Howard University. Uh, Penn State and Northern Kentucky University to the mix of folks. And of course, this builds on Super Tiger and in a previous Heavy Nuclear Explorer proposal that we put in that didn't get selected, but was well reviewed. And just pulling a pretty picture from that proposal material, um, we aim to probe two stages in the grand cycle of matter in the galaxy. And you got to use these big words and proposals, right? So how nuclear matter is synthesized and then distributed through the galaxy. So what's the nature of the astrophysical reservoirs of nuclei at the cosmic ray source? Well, we thought that it was OB associations that explained everything, but maybe there's more to it, right? That's why we need to probe higher and confirm the super tiger measurements. Also mechanisms like which nuclei are removed from the reservoirs and injected in the cosmic ray accelerators. Well, we, we had a nice model, but that's no longer quite working. So there's real in incentive to keep pushing on this. So the tiger's instrument, um, shares many of the same characteristics of, of, of the Tiger Super Tiger type of instrument, only it has silicon layers instead of um, simulators, which have far better, more reliable charge responses as a function of, as a function of charge. Um, it's much easier to, you, you, you make a measurement and you think it's, an, it's a lead 82, it's far more likely to really be in a lead 82 than it is to be misidentified when you're using silicon. It's just better resolution and doesn't have saturation effects that are a major issue. 
and the uh, curve showing the solid state detector, silicon strip detector um, there is from a CERN lead beam test where you see the fragments of, you see lead peak at the far right and the fragmentate fragments all the way down and the peaks are identified. So, and it would still use uh, Trankov detectors, acrylic and aerogel. So it's very similar. And this is what we would predict for one year um, from Tigris on the space station. And that's the basis you have to propose for with the Astro 6 pioneers. You have to get your science out in one year. And I show um, the predictions for um, solar average and solar minimum maximum. And solar maximum is the worst case scenario, but you can see there's very little difference between the green and blue lines, in that, which is, a, is an effect of being within the geomagnetic field. The low energy stuff's already screened out. And the solar, the solar field would screen out the rest. The red line is the super tiger measurements of Nathan's. And you can see that basically we would get similar statistics to uh, Nathan's super tiger all the way through barium, but we'd also have some preliminary resolvable measurements out all the way to lead, lead flat. And also I've, I have about, we have half the statistics of the, that HEO Hypnicola Explorer measurement that I mentioned earlier as the, as the existing best for above barium. So we'd be able to check that and also begin to see how the events are falling in large charge groups that they were able to resolve. And so, and again, the main focus is to try to understand what the source material is and the accelerator injection. And the figure in the upper right is what we get from supernova production and massive star outflows. And this is, this is what uh, Kettering and Lauders put us on to way back when we were doing Tiger. But now that we, now that it's been seen that binary interstellar mergers do eject matter. That matter is seen um, to be composed of heavy nuclei. Um, that's a definite source of the high, heavy R process. And so there are models in the bottom, for instance, in the bottom left showing uh, what you might get out of merger type events. And so by probing the abundances of elements further up the periodic table, we can hope to determine what the world of contributions might be to not just the cosmic rays, but also possibly also the sources in general for the heavier elements. And this is just the official acknowledgments, um, thanking NASA for funding both Kellett and Super Tiger. And Tigris has been already gotten support from the Bell Center for Space Sciences and uh, the Peggy and Steve Foster Foundation. And then we have the standard disclaimer because this is grant supported in some way, but NASA is not responsible for all the mistakes. And that would be it. Thank you. Ten minutes. That's not the worst amount of time for questions, if there are any. Brian, right. Brian, uh, a couple slides back, maybe on your advertising slide, you had a tree statement: cosmic rays regulate star formation rate. What do you mean by that? Okay. Well, they feed back. Um, so they feed into the magnetic fields, and by supporting and partly supporting magnetic fields, um, that kind of that, that counters, it's like, it's a pressure that counters star formation. So they, you know, the, the degree to which they're, they're driving, driving memory field impacts that. I don't you know the exact details are beyond me at the moment. I guess I'll have to know them better for that part of the uh, proposal. I didn't make this particular thing. Okay. Does How does it? You might just say how the energy density in cosmic rays compares to magnetic energy density in right, starlight well, stuff. So. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, the, basically they're equal partitions, as I remember from Kausik's class, about a third of, you know, power, similar power budget in starlight magnetic fields and cosmic rays. Yes. Yeah. Um, so when you showed the plot of the pellet data, you showed how like the different experiments and different types disagree. Can you maybe tell us just a little bit more about are there certain systematic errors that you might be really concerned about when comparing these different data sets? So you're driving all these slides. So all right. So all. So yeah, these kinds of plots. Um, all these are space measurements. And, but they're not the same type of instrument, right? So there are magnetic spectrometers like the alpha magnetic spectrometer on the space station where you have a, you have a magnet so you can really, um, to help determine energy. 
and that's a more more reliable measurement of energy as a rule in principle than a calorimeter because calorimeter the energy deposition is complicated by especially if you talk about nuclei if it's an electromagnetic shower if it's just an electron or a photon showering um, it's much better it's, it's, easy, it's easier to predict the uh, calorimeter's response but with nuclei um, the fragmentation cross, cross sections aren't as well known so that's why we go to the accelerators and we use multiples. So that's, that's why, in fact, we use the three simulations to try to get a handle on what the systematic uncertainties are just from that deconvolution of energy based on the simulations, because we have to use Monte Carlo and information to tell us, you know, what that, what instrument responds with that energy, what energy corresponds to that. Um, so there, those, there are those features. Um, they're certainly part of our Calette uncertainty. Um, and then, the, you know, but the, the crazy thing, of course, is the calorimeters don't agree in all cases. If it were like the calorimeters and magnetic spectrometers were always two separate camps, it'd be one thing, but they're not. Sometimes one magnetic spectrometer agrees with the calorimeter and other times the other one does. It's, it's, there's also Dampy, a Chinese a free flyer that's similar to Kellett in capability, slightly larger. Um, that's on the end, it's indeed plot ends. You, know, you see Dampy data points. And they're, they're you know, contemporaneous. We, we met them at CERN doing their calibrations, right? And uh, they, you know, again, sometimes they agree with us and sometimes they don't. And they're another calorimeter instrument. So it's just, uh, it's one of those mysteries where it, a lot of it comes down to which simulation you're using, how you're using it. And we, cal has been looking into, um, you know, not just the simulations used by other groups, but the exact configuration. So we've been trying to do the simulations using the same version of Jayant that say AMS is using the exact same version, like, you know, configured the same way. And so far that has not been the magic bowl that explains differences, but it does, does definitely show differences, right? So it's, the problem is, is uh, you, you do have to rely on, on the, the Monte Carlo in the modeling and that's it has its limitations. But that's why it's best that we have multiple instruments. Um, and Alan, I think was next. Oh, Buckley. Oh, well, you know, sorry, Jim, I'm used to you speaking up. Yeah, I'm, no, I was trying I to be, I, I was trying to be right polite now. uncharacteristically. So right. uh, I was just, <laughs> I was just gonna say another Washu experiment, Veritas, uh, Oh. measured the spectrum out to higher energies and agrees, I think, with the upper curve. And before that, Hess in an independent analysis saw it. So these are ground-based gamma ray instruments. They have a huge effective area, but the systematics for this type of study are viewed to be worse than these direct measurements, which is probably why one might choose not to include them. But um, they do kind of go a bit higher in energy. Yeah, and, well, I, I know that yeah. you know, in the paper, the those will be there, right? This is just a yeah. preliminary at the conference one. And I, I right. just put these because they're the most recent. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, of course. And that's the exciting thing though, is here's an instance where you're getting overlap in measurement between a direct measurement in, in a you know regular size detector and a ground array that's looking up at the sky. Right. So Which, that's mm -hmm. an interesting region of cross correlation. And, and the total electron spectrum and, of course, the positron fraction are of great interest to, you know, things like indirect dark matter detection and other more exotic things that could contribute or nearby pulsars and so on that could contribute. So, right. so they, it's a good thing to look at. Yeah. And I'd like to mention that Kellett measures the all electron spectrum because it can't distinguish positrons from electrons. Unlike EMS, which has the magnet and they bend the particles and the particles bend oppositely. We, you know, at Jim's suggestion, we did look at uh, the range of which we could use the geomagnetic field to um, distinguish electrons and positrons. And there is a limited energy range. Um, and I don't remember off the top of my head because it's been a long time since I wrote that paper, but it's a limited range, but it would be a measurement. And it's the kind of thing you could make a grad student do. Uh, if you had one that had any free time. So I guess you had to Manel, sorry. So you showed that for the proposal where you're planning to put a sort of Tiger-inspired instrument on the ISF. Right. 
you showed that the, the expectation was that the statistics would be similar to the data from Super Tiger that you already have. So is that just a matter of size that the one that goes in the ISS has to be smaller? Or is it that you optimize this one for the higher, uh, for the heavier element? It is the, the comparable statistics in one year is a function of relative instrument size. And uh, we like that bigger, but we are constrained to fit in the box. And the box is, it's a refrigerator size box. And Super Tiger had those two big modules. And also Super Tiger, so flying by the poles, at least you don't have the GMA screening in any significant way, but then the atmosphere does a really great job of screening too. And so the energy ranges for um, Super Tiger and, uh, and Tigris would be rather similar in the end. Although it'd be really nice not to, to do atmospheric corrections, which is the part that I do for Super Tiger and Tiger, and uh, don't trust the person doing it so much. So I'd really like another space measurement, which reminds me of again the real value in Wolfgang's Calette measurement is not just that it's a significant measurement in its own right, but that it also is a comparison with totally different systematics, right? We have geomimic screening to worry about, but that's much easier. I think that's really much easier to get a handle on than the uh, atmospheric corrections where the cross sections are so uncertain. And you have to make gross, gross assumptions. To correct for, I can't do fine degree, you know, um, I can't do fine corrections for like bins of incidence angle or um, energy or anything because the, you know, the ultra heavy statistics are so low. I just have to do one global correction and then assume, have an average atmospheric depth and that's fishy. So it's, it's been encouraging so far that the Calat and indeed ACE Chris measurements have agreed as well as they have with what we've shown previously in the Tiger and the Super Tiger, but that was a side, sorry. Mike? Uh, a few more questions on, on the calibration. So since you get to pick up your instrument after you're done with it. Um, with Super Tiger, yeah. Yeah, do you, well, at least sometimes, hopefully, <laughs> do you do pre-flight and post-flight calibration of it just to see if it changed? You know, I'm looking from the perspective of a satellite where the agreement between the different instruments is, is excellent as far as anyone is concerned who flies the satellite because they never agree to better than like, you know, 10 or 20 percent. Um, I guess the, the, huh. the second question related to that is for the simulation tools, if they're going to be a combination of theoretical modeling and data input like cross sections. <laughs> Uh, feel what the, the differences between the different simulation tools are in terms of whether it's closely related to the theoretical modeling or the database input into the modeling. So, all right, I guess I'll start with the second question. You have to remember the first one again when I get back to it. But um, you can usually pick um, this, you know, like the, the cross section physics models, you can choose to be the same between simulations, and yet they still have their own differences, of course. And um, the Epic simulation that is the primary for Kellett, because one of her collaborators was the original author of it. Um, you know, I know that as throughout both the, the beam test phase and the, the actual data from on flight, you know, they've been checking and checking and, and finding things that are quite right or missing or or where the, the simulation crashes because it gets overloaded. Um, so there's there's a, you know, there are a lot of nuance, a lot of differences between the packages and, and, and finding them is not, not, not easy. I mean, one particular area um, where there's can be significant difference is um, backsplash, how much backsplash you get from an event. In, you know, and it's really important in calorimeter because you have all this dense materials because you're trying to capture the energy. But when you get interactions and you're fragmenting, stuff will bounce back. And being able to properly model that, there's been some real differences between the packages there. And I don't know the degree to which that would be a function of the basic physics models. I don't think it would be that strong, but clearly there's some difference between the packages that you're seeing a difference in the backsplash. And then um, do we you know, calibrate? Well, the Super Tiger, we, we don't generally, we have taken Super Tiger detectors to accelerators for, for trying to calibrate the responses and to understand the scintillator saturation effects that, that make it hard to predict charges the higher at the periodic table, um, but we haven't made a point of doing like a full instrument beam test kind of cross calibration. Um, we, you know, obviously, you know, we put it back together on the ice and we are doing 
tests, and I like the test, the cal cross calibrations we were able to significant, most significant ones were muons, right? So we would, we did look at the muons. Um, we had muons runs from before we flew and crashed and reassembled, and after, and they were generally, they were they were acceptable agreement, I guess, is the most I can say off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, we probably don't do as much in that way as maybe we should. But yeah, after we get things that are kind of busted up and it's it's the state it's in. And Henry? Uh, uh, this, uh, oh, I just, the model's missing something. Um, I, I have a pet theory about it's an injection and accelerator, but I, yeah, there's, there's something here. Um, I'm, I don't think it's going to be a science paper by the time we're done with it, but it certainly is interesting and hopefully is enough to build interest for, for another instrument. How does a FIP model look at first ionization potential trend? Well, when we looked at it, it doesn't agree anywhere as well as the, the volatility, but I guess we haven't, Nathan, we have not looked to see if somehow FIP, FIP is magically working so much better for this group. That would be, that would be worth, 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 worth looking at. And Nathan's nodding, so I guess we'll do that. Okay, Probably not. There, <laughs> yeah, there's that too. Right, I mean, and this whole model is based on on you know grains. I mean, it's, it, how are you accelerating normal gas? Well, so the assumption, so the original model assumed that the grains and gas were accelerated differently, and it had it posited that the gas should have a mass dependence trend, but not the uh, the the grains, because it's the mass of the atom itself that governs its efficiency and acceleration. It's the rigidity of that atom. But here we found that you see trends for both the refractory and the volatiles, and that that's where the sputtering idea comes in. It's the sputtering cross section that relates. The thought for why you would have a volatile in working in this model is that everything might condense to some degree on these grains, and so the volatiles are just much less like even. But I mean, even the, the xenon, well, I guess if it's cold or, I, you know, I, that's a great question. This is one of these things where, where it's time for us to go talk to Katerina again, to, uh, to hear about. Hear about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like I yes? I don't know if you can see me. I don't know what is going on. I actually saw this data for the first time right now. And my first thought is, that the uh, barium peak region looks quite interesting. And I wonder if that could be just a signature of the R process uh, peak. And since we still don't know how many different R process sites we have, I suspect that it's a nucleosynthesis effect because the fractionation between xenon and krypton, rubidium and strontium and also tellurium and selenium strikes me as odd because chem a chemical fractionation wouldn't work, so it must be a nuclear effect. But this is just my first impression. I have to digest this data. Just as sure. well. Well, and, and, and in fairness to Nathan, that was his first thought too. That it was looking like an R process. Yes. Enhancement. And yes, yeah, so that would be that would in a lot of ways be the more interesting. Yeah. The, the other thing is, I, the, the niobium is a little bit odd, so, and uh, with uh, molybdenum stuff, I don't know how a P process would work, but it clearly needs to be scrutinized for nucleosynthesis effects. Well, thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Brian. It's really interesting. I'm not doing any other questions. Thanks again. Yeah.